Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing well and ready to attack the last three months of the year. Here at eToro, we have you covered. So get your notepads out. Feel free to ask us questions in the chat if you are watching on YouTube. And let's get started on our fourth quarter investment outlook. For those of you that don't know, my name is Sam North and I am an analyst in the UK and co-host of the Digest and Invest podcast series. And I am joined by three legends of the game. From left to right, as you see it on screen, Callie Cox, our US investment analyst, Josh Gilbert, our Australian analyst, and my wonderful co-host on Digest and Invest and the man, the myth, the legend, Ben Laidler, who is our global market strategist one of us in this recording today has turned 28 i will leave you all to guess who that is comment who you think that will be my money is on ben laidler ben we're coming to you first josh and kelly coming up very shortly uh what happened in quarter three what stood out for you well the bad news is everything weakened a lot of things went down but it did come after this record-breaking first seven months rally um, the pullback, partly, I think, just a natural pause for breath, partly the typical poorer summer seasonality. But we also faced a number of fundamental challenges. We had to work through everything from rising U.S. bond yields, rising oil prices, you know, this pressured valuations, this raised doubts about growth, this stoked recession fears. Um, we also saw just a widening growth gap. Uh, opening up across the world, everything from you know the U.S. economy staying exceptionally strong, through to China sputtering, through to the manufacturing heavy German uh, economy going into recession. But there were positive surprises. I'm sitting here in the U.K., which somewhat miraculously is not in a uh, recession right now, despite being widely forecast. Uh, the better news we saw uh, came, I think, from inflation and global central banks. Inflation's just kept falling uh, and these dramatic interest rate hikes, which we've seen over the last sort of year and a half, have potentially ended. So we now have the US, Europe and the UK central banks all on hold. And we've even started to see some interest rate cuts coming through from Brazil and coming through from Poland. Um, Cut the surface below the surface, though, so it hasn't all just been about the macro. A lot going on at the company level. Second quarter earnings season, definitely better than feared. The IPO market has reopened uh, everything from the arm to the cart uh, IPOs. NVIDIA has continued to lead this IPO, this AI boom. And in Europe, Novo Nordisk has become the biggest company. Uh, on the continent, on the back of its weight loss drug and unseating uh, luxury leader, LVMH. Maybe if we just flick to the next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about, just to put some numbers on the quarterly performance, you can just see there on the left-hand side, some of the things I was talking about, oil and the dollar, the only major assets up, you know, this quarter, you know, stocks across the board being hit by this surge in volatility. Bitcoin giving back some of its you know, asset leading gains you know, of the year. Uh, similarly, you know, best performer of the year on the stock side, Japan uh, and tech giving back some of their gains. And amongst the laggards, you know, like the UK, you know, doing a little bit better. Um, and some continuing to do badly, you know, like China, which um, uh, seems to have just uh, continued to underwhelm all year. Uh, on the right hand side, just, you know, maybe switching gears and talking a little bit about what we think is coming. Um, this is what we know is coming. Um, so we have third quarter earnings season just around the corner. I think that's going to be more important than ever. We have a very heavy election timetable uh, from Poland to Argentina. We have a big consumer focus uh, from China's Singles Day on as we enter the busiest shopping quarter of the year. And you know, hopes are high that central banks do really stay you know, on hold. And we are at the top of this interest rate mountain. That's it. Amazing. Well, look at that. VIX up over 30%. Oil 
nearly 30 percent and the us dollar the dollar index up four percent the bears are sitting there right now licking their lips thinking can it continue into the last three months of the year and that ben really brings me to the next question how are you seeing this for the uh the remaining three months outlook for quarter four let's see what you're thinking so i think you know third quarter hopefully was the pause that refreshes markets to lead us higher in the fourth quarter you know that's you know, my view, I think, you know, whether that happens or not, the sort of four key things that we're watching, you know, firstly, that the US economy is probably as good as it can get right now. It will slow under the lagged impact of the Fed rate hikes that we've seen. But this is not necessarily bad news. You know, it will help bring inflation down. It will set us up for interest rate cuts, I think, you know, next year. And crucially, to answer the title, we do see a soft economic landing and not a damaging recession. Uh, and Callie's going to give you, you know, a lot more detail on this in, in a second. Uh, but it does make us more focused on assets like tech, which are more sensitive to this lower inflation view uh, and less sensitive to this potential economic slowdown, which I think is going to be more of a hit and take more um, of have more of an impact on things like uh, small caps and commodities. Uh, the second thing that we're watching, you know, carefully is this coming earnings season, you know, more important now than ever. And it should mark the end of the profits recession that we've been living through for the last uh, few quarters. Just remember, all the market gains you've made this year have been with because of higher valuations, you know, not because of earnings. So I think the story from here, though, is earnings beginning to pick up, you know, that baton. And I am confident that that you know, will happen. And we're already beginning to see an earnings recovery come through uh, from, from tech stocks. And, and that's important. You know, tech is the biggest sector in markets. And we're also beginning to see less pressure on corporate profit margins with inflation uh, coming down. Thirdly, the other thing we're watching is seasonality. Um, you know, the summer weakness we saw is you know, pretty typical. But we also, you normally see fourth quarter strength. The fourth quarter, typically the strongest months you know, of the year as investors focus and reallocate into the year ahead. And I think this fourth quarter seasonality could be particularly uh, important this year. What does next year look like? On the face of it, it could be a pretty good year. If the Fed and the ECB are cutting interest rates, if corporate profits are rebounding to double digit levels, and a lot of investors are still already, you know, are pretty cautious. So I think you know, we could be set up for quite strong fourth quarter seasonality. And finally, the fourth thing that we're watching is just this big wall of worry that we're sort of facing, you know, right now. Everything from higher oil prices, higher bond yields, strikes, shutdowns, you know, you name it. Um, importantly, though, I don't see any of them really having a lasting impact. You know, oil and bond yields, I think, will naturally self-correct if they get too high as they stoke economic sort of slowdown fears, whilst, you know, strikes, government shutdowns, you know, are typically uh, fairly short-lived. Uh, so just finally, turning the page quickly, I just wanted to show you what your fellow retail investors are thinking right now uh, as a little bit of context. So across the asset classes, regions, sectors, themes, you know, starting up there on the top left, you can see of all the asset classes, stocks are still, you know, the favorites, but they are losing a little bit of support versus the last time we did uh, this survey. Maybe, you know, understandably, given that, you know, stocks haven't uh, been performing well, uh, but you know, crypto definitely getting, you know, another look here, maybe ahead of the Bitcoin halving and all these ETF applications that are out there. Josh is going to get into that. Uh, in a bit. Uh, switching to the top right, you can see, you know, what are the favorite stock markets? The US still, you know, right up there, maybe unsurprisingly, but followed by emerging markets, followed by China, two smaller um, underperforming assets that have become very cheap. So investors definitely been more contrarian here. Uh, and then, you know, down at the bottom, the UK remains very out of favor. But Maybe this is something that's been helping uh, in this sort of recent sell-off with expectations already very low. 
Uh, and then just want to look down at the bottom. You look on the left hand side, looking at the sectors. It's still all about tech. Uh, it's been losing a little bit of popularity. Uh, we're seeing the energy sector sort of picking up uh, as crude oil prices have soared. And then on the bottom right, finally, just talking about investment themes, you can just see disruptive tech head and shoulders above all, really testament to the excitement there is out there on artificial intelligence, AI, and its rapid adoption. But also, interestingly, clean tech you know, hasn't performed well so far this year, but still very firmly uh, the second most popular investment theme out there. Sam, back to you. Thank you, Ben. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for contributing to the survey. But now is the time for you to have your say in the chat. Let me know. S&P 500 by the end of the year. Is it going to be higher or lower than where we are now? Don't not put an answer in. Now is your time to let us know. Callie, we're coming to you now. And there's a great saying, which I'm sure many people have heard. When the US sneezes, the world catches a cold. So we care about the US greatly. How are you seeing it at the moment? Uh, are we in good health? Do we need to be worried about a cold? How are you feeling? <laughs> well, Sam, I think I have the easiest section of this uh, this quarterly outlook because the US has been far and away the best performing economy or major economy in the world this year. And right now we have some issues on our plate. Uh, ben alluded to a few of them, but we have a major strike uh, from the United Auto Workers Association that's currently ongoing, uh, along with a bunch of other strikes uh, that can easily pile up. We have potential government shutdown looming uh, toward the end of this week. It might already be happening by the time everybody's watching this. Uh, we have surging oil prices, surging yields, and uh, we have student debt payments that are starting up for the first time in three years uh, post-COVID. So I just rattled off a long list, but you know these are all good problems to have in the scope of the major problem that many of us thought we'd have at the beginning of the year, and that's a U.S. economy recession. Uh, that recession still looks to be far away, and I want y'all to focus on these points, but this is the most important chart going into the fourth quarter. And there are some very important charts, but right now, as you can see, third quarter growth is projected to be some of the strongest growth for the U.S. economy in decades. And like me, I mean, many of us came into this year not expecting that to be the case. So right now, my focus in the U.S. is around what the economy will do and more specifically what consumers will do because consumer spending in the US is 70% of the economy. And clearly in the summer as inflation came down and as wages uh, out started outpacing inflation again, we saw consumer spending pick up. I mean Americans love to spend, but you know they just haven't quit for these past few years. So you know, when we step back, when we take a look at the problems, I remind everybody that the fundamentals are what matters. If you're a long-term investor or looking three to six plus months out on this time frame, um, there's immense pressure on the U.S. economy right now. The Fed has hiked rates to five to five point two five percent. That is that is a very high rate, some of the highest we've seen in decades. Uh, so you know, the onus is on the economy to slow down. Um, it, it seems like. You know, we are at that pivot point and it's hard to see growth expanding too much from here. But markets are digesting uh, this uptick in growth projections and, you know, all the worries that come along with it. And from my perspective, you know, that's a really good problem to have, because when you consider the fact that, you know, most bear markets in the U.S. start with recessions or unforeseen market crises, uh, I'm fine at going with, you know, some overheated inflation worries for now. Uh, so as Ben mentioned, I think positioning is especially important right now uh, at the juncture we're in, where growth is really strong, but it's expected to slow in the coming quarters. I mean, right now, I, I think it's smart to keep an eye on value, uh, you know, cheaper cyclical sectors. I mean, energy has been a, a quiet outperformer over the past month or two. And I mean, I think that just speaks to the fact uh, that the economy is going through another change, another rotation, and that there are many sector stories to take opportunities of. Uh, but at the same time, remember, you know, there are a lot of headwinds for the economy right now. And that doesn't mean we could fall into a recession. I agree with Ben. Um, a soft landing looks very possible still. But 
uh, you know, keep that in mind as you pick sectors, especially those rate sensitive sectors, you know, thinking about quality as well. You know, think about the companies you're investing in if they could survive a recession. And that requires taking a look at the balance sheet, um, understanding if those companies are profitable or self-funded and understanding their competitive advantages. So, you know, coming into the fourth quarter, I'll note too that it is a seasonally strong quarter for U.S. stocks. And I think we have a lot of, while we're tackling a lot of obstacles, I also think we have a lot of tailwinds that are building up. And I'll leave you with this. What usually forces markets into, or what usually forces stocks into bear markets? Like I said, recessions, market crises, but often the biggest risk is the one you don't see coming. And we have a lot of risks that people see coming. So I think you can take comfort in that. Um, like Ben said, we have a wall of worry and you know we might've uh, been pushed off a little bit here with the S&P down 7% but I think we're poised to climb it once again. Thank you, Kelly. Yeah, very good point, actually, uh, as we enter the, the fourth quarter. And from a Fed point of view, I know Ben mentioned it earlier, 34 days, six hours, 35 minutes, and 22 seconds away from the next Fed meeting at the time of recording. Currently, 22% chance of a hike there. And the December meeting, December the 13th, we're at 42% right now. Things will change a lot, I am sure. Next up, Josh. Um, we've uh, obviously had a, a very strong start to the year for tech. And I believe in the last recording, there was mention of you having to, at some point, potentially eat your hat if tech could replicate that. You'll be thankful, I guess, in a way that hasn't happened. Uh, how are you seeing both tech uh, and crypto, but also China too? Yeah, luckily I didn't get a cake hat for my birthday, um, <laughs> so, so I would have probably been eating that if uh, if tech continued to deliver. But um, no, we, we've said it already, it's been a great year for tech, but it has taken that breather in Q3, which, you know, Ben said it then, we, we've sort of seen it as healthy. You know, it came from that weak seasonality, these higher bond yields, and obviously this sort of hawkish stance that we've had from the Fed, uh, you know, ultimately with central banks around the globe reiterating this idea of sort of higher for longer rates. And that has put tech on, on the back foot. And I think that comes despite what was a resilient earnings season, you know, especially from the likes of say, you know, NVIDIA, you know, delivered on, on sort of their promise of, of sort of a bumper quarter. And it's all been driven by the Magnificent Seven. Um, you know, that is the new sort of set of fangs, if you like. That is the name that we're calling them now. And, and it, they are the names that have been delivering. They are the names that have been sort of driving tech. Then we sort of look to, you know, what is ahead for tech. And, and we've already gone through a couple of the sort of the risks and, you know, Callie and Ben have both mentioned, you know, those risks that are there. And, and obviously the big one for tech is, is obviously bond yields. And of course it is going to be the Fed and the potential of further hikes and, and also the pushback of rate cuts as well. But then also I want to talk about the sort of the catalysts that we sort of see helping tech and, and sort of driving tech. We mentioned the improving macro environment. That is good news for tech. The, the, our view of sort of lower inflation, you know, and rate cuts coming in 2024 makes for a good environment for tech. And, and I've said it there, it's not going to be all one way because, you know, that, that sort of narrative of, you know, higher for longer could stick around. Um, it could stay with us. But I think that, you know, our view of easing bond yields, um, is going to make a sort of a you know better, stronger, fundamental backdrop for tech as we move towards the back end of this year and move into sort of 2024. And I think it creates you know a bit more of a sort of a risk on environment, if you like. Investors will feel uh, a little bit more confident there. And tech has been leading the earnings recovery. You know they cut costs early. If we think back to the start of the year, uh, all of these sort of job job cuts that came from the big names like Microsoft, Meta, Amazon. Uh, again, it wasn't something that was great for the consumer, but it was you know ultimately applauded by Wall Street, and we saw that sort of come through in Q2 earnings. You know, Meta was a key one, a huge margin improvement in the quarter. So all of that sort of put together, I think, points to sort of tech having sort of more legs and and sort of, you know, more more um, sort of, you know, not the end of this rally ultimately, you know, coming from tech. Then to sort of maybe flip to to sort of the other side and, and, we, and we look to sort of China, um, mm -hmm. which has maybe sort of been the disappointment of, of sort of this year. 
Um, it's had a weaker than expected economy. We've had plunging valuations. And just to sort of put that in, in context, the Hang Seng tech index is currently trading at more than half the valuation of the S&P 500 tech sector. Um, and, you know, that has also caused investor sentiment um, to, to completely capitulate as well. And, you know, there's, there's, you know, not many investors that are looking at China with, with positivity right now. But we believe that the economy you know, is starting to find that bottom, um, which is going to sort of support um, growth. And, and that is starting to stabilize growth because we are starting to see support come um from the government there and, and we're starting to see stimulus measures roll through we're starting to see rate cuts again they are token gestures it's maybe not exactly what we need but we don't believe that china is going to be in a rush to sort of roll out huge amounts of stimulus measures but as i said it has start to started to stabilize growth and therefore improve data points you know retail sales has picked up industrial production has picked picked up evidently off a low base but again, um, it has therefore picked up. So we view China as a contrarian opportunity for investors. Um, and there are reasons to like it. It's dominating the global car market, luxury market, mining, and much, much more. So again, if, you, if you're feeling contrarian, um, China is, uh, is a market to sort of keep on the watch list. And then finally, crypto. Um, surprising to some maybe, but it is still the best performing asset class year to date, despite what is... Uh, you know, a very depressed sentiment from investors. It kind of feels as if crypto has sort of dropped off the conversation uh, at some point. And, you know, Q3, uh, evidently more than ever, given its sort of range bound trading over that time. But there are a number of catalysts that we see for crypto, um, whether that is the improving macro environment that we've sort of talked about, the upcoming Bitcoin halving, which is going to be a real key catalyst, um, which comes early next year. But importantly, institutional adoption, um, which we believe is, is sort of the key for the next sort of bull run, really, for crypto. And I think that institutional investment comes from clearer regulation and the acceptance of spot ETFs, whether that's from Bitcoin or Ethereum. We've got plenty of applications in there now. But it does feel that we are starting to inch closer, whether that's from the BlackRock application. Uh, we know they have a fantastic record of getting through ETFs through um, and also Grayscale's recent court win as well. On top of that, we've also had recent changes to sort of U.S. accounting rule for companies that are holding crypto, which supports institutions owning more crypto as well. So we believe it's going to be a really exciting Q4, um, probably more of a year ahead uh, for crypto. Um, but I do believe we are starting to see investor sentiment return to crypto slowly, but it is making its way back. Uh, and then, Sam, if you want to just flip to the last slide, we just want to cover a little bit on our retail investor beat survey. This is a survey of 10,000 retail investors in 13 countries from the U.S., Australia, and of course, across Europe. We do this every quarter, and it is a great way to look into the mind of retail investors, your fellow investors. Um, and what we've seen on the left is a huge uptake in the number of investors willing to let AI run their portfolios. So we haven't discussed AI a huge amount, but we do know that it is still the dominant player on Wall Street. It is still the reason that we are going to see tech dominate uh, over the sort of the next 12 months. And I think that this shows how far AI has come this year. But I also think it speaks to the power of the technology and how far that has developed already within the last sort of, you know, nine months of this year. And it just shows how far we still have to go. And then finally, on the right, we, we've sort of spoken about crypto there, but we are seeing a huge crypto ownership amongst investors, uh, amongst retail investors. And, and that's really important because investors are starting to see crypto or are seeing crypto as a long duration asset. This isn't an asset class that they're looking at um, and want to sell the next day. They're looking to, to sort of the future. Retail investors are forward looking. Um, and I think that's really important. But it is also the reason that we view institutional investment as a catalyst, because this is an asset class that is already very well owned by retail investors. That's it from me. Back to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Josh. Yeah. Uh, another question for those uh, watching on YouTube. Would you let AI run your portfolio? If no, I want to know why. 
think you're smarter than AI, do you? Uh, interested to hear all your responses. Next up then, Ben, we'll, we'll uh, use this opportunity just to sort of wrap it all up before I uh, ask some audience questions to you, which I've collected, all three of you. Uh, so, Ben, let's have a, a quick look at this slide. Yeah, I, I don't want to stand in the way of the interesting bit, but, you know, we're pretty positive still. Um, fundamentally, because we do think we can thread this economic needle of slowing the global economy down enough to bring inflation down and set us up for interest rate cuts next year, you know, without plunging us off that cliff, you know, into recession. You know why? Because consumers are very resilient, because labor markets are cooling, but still, you know, pretty healthy, because China you know, is, has reopened. You know, all of this, I think, are key, key supports uh, to the economic economy. Uh, or to the global economy, you know, but this outlook for lower growth and lower inflation, you know, alongside what are still, frankly, you know, pretty high risks, you know, does keep us focused on, you know, more defensive assets and those, you know, most sensitive to lower inflation. So think bonds, think tech, you know, even even crypto, and still sort of shying away from assets which are, you know, really need stronger growth today to work, you know, like commodities, like small caps, like industrials. Um, the biggest fundamental driver, and we're pretty positive on it, is this co company profits recovery. You know, some may ask, how can we be so positive on this, you know, even as economies cool? Well, it's because tech is leading and because the driver is AI, because the driver is it's cost cutting. You know, it's not uh, driven by the underlying uh, economy. It's because we're seeing less pressure on profit margins coming through from lower inflation. It's because we're lapping this economic weakness of you know early 2023. And it's because we still think we're going to see a soft landing, not a recession. And companies are well able to navigate uh, to navigate that. Uh, but finally, you know, the, the risks are clearly there. They're probably above you know, average, everything from sticky inflation to surging oil prices. So you know, you have to be diversified. You need to be very sensitive to risk in your portfolio. You know, it's really you know more important than ever. That's it. Nice one. Thank you very much, Ben. Uh, now I've got uh, six questions, two for each of you. I've got a stopwatch in front of me. You lose points if you go over a minute. So no pressure. Callie, we're coming to you first. Uh, we all know the uh, US consumer is, is, is resilient. The question is, what is the biggest risk to consumer spending right now? I think it's oil. And Ben touched on this earlier, but oil, I'll start with this. So student loan payments are going to start next week. They may have already started by the time that you're viewing this. And a lot of Wall Street analysts are painting that as a big risk. And while it's certainly a risk out there, <clears throat> it's money from the spending bucket that could uh, go into the student loan payment bucket. Uh, oil is the much more systemic and much more problematic risk for Americans' wallets. Um, Americans spent about 70 billion on student loans back in 2019. Last year, they spent about 500 billion uh, on oil, gas prices, energy prices, or energy costs. So, you know, it's it's a much bigger risk to American wallets. Um, I still think the consumer is in a good place. Uh, I'll, I'll say the risk that could be coming that isn't that may not be here yet could be a breakdown in the job market and unemployment um, that typically precedes recessions uh, for obvious reasons. You know, if you don't have income, you can't spend money. Uh, but, you know, the risk that's here right now uh, that's most detrimental, in my view, uh, is oil and rising oil prices. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, Josh, for you, this one was sent in earlier. Uh, is current weakness across tech an opportunity? Well, I, I think given everything that we've discussed today, I think that investors will will see the current weakness as an opportunity. Um, NASDAQ 100 off 10% since the highs of the year. We've got transformational growth around AI, cloud, cybersecurity. We saw last quarter, I think the bottom and the rebound of digital ad spend. Ben alluded to it there, but tech is at the forefront of earnings growth. And importantly, if yields ease off, that is going to support the valuations. And Ben mentioned it earlier. That is the reason 
that you've made money in markets so far this year. And I also think to to quote Mr. Buffett, you know, it's a great time that when others are fearful in the market, it is time to be greedy. Um, and I'll leave it there with Mr. Buffett quoted. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can always quote Warren himself. Ben, uh, coming to you, our very own Mr. Buffett, uh, what concerns you most about the current wall of worry? Yeah, I'm going to sound like a broken record and agree with everything Callie said. You know, it's oil, right? And, and it's oil because it's a double hit. Um, so Callie said, you know, US consumers spend over 500 billion a year on gasoline. What that means is that the backup in gasoline prices you've had in the last couple of months means they're spending an extra 150 billion now. That's a consumer tax. Um, that's equivalent, just to put it in perspective, to three times the annual sales of Macy's. Um, so, you know, so that's one. And it's also, you know, the second hit is on inflation and the interest rate outlook. Uh, so, you know, none of that's good, but um, it should self-correct. You know, as people cut back on using, um, you know, gasoline and as it feeds through into sort of growth fears, you know, every dollar or cent higher in gasoline prices at the pump, you know, consumers and companies are thinking, how can I use less? Um, or if you're a company, can I substitute for something cheaper, you know, like natural gas? You know, one way or the other, you know, I do think there is a natural adjustment in there as, you know, the higher prices go, the lower um, demand will um, but will be. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Kelly, uh, your last question, then Josh and Ben, I'm coming back to you. Uh, Kelly, are you concerned about the market breadth uh, and also the rise of the Magnificent Seven? Why or why not? Yeah, so breadth for anybody wondering uh, is basically a term that's used for how many stocks are actually driving a broader market returns. Uh, and the Magnificent Seven are part of that story. I mean, there are a lot of narratives out there about how these bigger tech and uh, tech plus NVIDIA companies are, uh, you know, some of the only stocks moving up uh, or have been some of the only stocks moving up over the past few months. Uh, and it's true. If you look at data, I mean, you see a thinning uh, amount of leadership when um, when you consider you know, what's actually driving U.S. markets in both directions. And many stocks are falling below their 200-day moving averages, which is a worry to me because that seems to be the next big test for the S&P 500. Uh, and below that, you don't have any major, major moving averages. But I say all that to say, I think it's important to remember that the U.S. economy is a sector-by-sector -sector story right now. Spending is still quite strong, especially in the services sector, even though manufacturing activity is coming down. Uh, we've seen energy stocks outperform over the past few months. For obvious reasons, oil prices are moving higher, uh, but that has its pros and cons. So right now, with so much uncertainty in the air, uh, with economic growth so strong, I don't see market breadth as a big long-term negative. Uh, but if you are a short-term trader, if you're looking at opportunities over the following days and weeks, it's something you should take into consideration because breadth is more of a technical concern. It it affects markets more in the short term. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, and, and Josh, as our resident Australian, how are you viewing the Australian market? Well, we spoke about China earlier, um, and that's had a huge impact on not only market sentiment, but also, you know, ASX is the, the ASX, which is the local market here in Australia. It has a huge exposure to materials. And I mentioned earlier how much of a powerhouse China is in terms of, you know, importing goods and, and steel and mining, etc. We've got a huge exposure to some of the biggest miners of the, in the world. So, you know, your Rio Tintos, your BHPs. Uh, so it's really felt the full effect of that. We've also got very little exposure to tech, which has weighed on the index. And you know, given that has been, you know, the best sector this year, we've also got large exposure to some of the worst performing sectors, such as financials, real estate and materials there, as I mentioned. But as I said earlier, with the measures that are sort of coming through from China, um, you know, that should really help to sort of buoy the ASX into the year end. We've already started to see a little bit of positivity coming through uh, in the materials sector here locally um, with, you know, some iron ore prices uh, picking up as well. And the good news is that the RBA could be at the forefront of the list as one of the central banks to cut interest rates. First, we've got inflation that is continuing to decline. We have got retail sales that are slowing. Um, and I think that could spell good news for the market. 
And it would support sectors, you know, such as real estate and materials if we do see those rate cuts uh, early in 2024. Um, and that is a big waiting uh, for the local market. So if we do see those rate cuts coming through, um, as many do expect at the start of next year, uh, then we could see some positivity from the local market and in Australia at the start of next year. Thank you, Josh. Uh, ben, last but by no means least, uh, let's talk about the UK quickly. It led last year. It lags this year. How do you view it? Yeah, feast or famine, right? Um, I, I think the UK does better from here. You know, this this sort of inflation fever, which has basically been the worst in the world, is starting to break. Uh, valuations have been very cheap for a while. And, and the pound's been very strong, which is actually a counterintuitive negative for a lot of UK companies that do a lot of business sort of around the world. So put that together, and I think those are the ingredients for... The UK doing better. I don't think it'll lead the rally. Um, you know, very similar to Australia. You know, it doesn't have a lot of sort of tech stocks and things that were. You know, I, I think will sort of lead here. But uh, I think it'll do a lot better going forward than it's done um, so far this year. My fingers are crossed on that. I tell you that. Um, please do remember to head over to Digest and Invest, the Toro Academy. There's loads of podcasts, courses, webinars, videos, everything that you can want is there. I'm excited. Josh, Callie and Ben, thank you very much for joining. And I'm sure I'll see you in three months time. <laughs>